glad to be with you guys tonight, and I'm glad that we get to uh, study the Psalms together. The Psalms are such a source of beauty uh, for us as the people of God. If you go to Rome and go make your way to visit the Pope over at the Vatican, um, and when you're done with him, and then you go and take your tour of the Sistine Chapel, and you'll be ready to see all the stuff that Michelangelo painted along the ceiling uh, from the creation of God and touching Adam, the little moment there with the finger. You know what I'm talking about, right? You want to look at your neighbor and just touch? I'm just kidding. That's really weird. I'm not going to make you do that. But you know the famous painting of the, on the chapel of the, of the, there in the, the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican? And it has pictures of other biblical scenes, other prophets that are painted along the ceiling as well. It kind of, you know, goes all the way around. I was struck. However, I, I was prepared to see the ceiling. I went in. But what they don't tell you, or perhaps I was just too culturally illiterate to know, uh, is that when you go in, as you walk in the door from the, behind the altar coming into the Sistine Chapel, there's another painting on the wall to your back. It's Michelangelo's painting as well, but that one is... The Last Judgment. It's an incredible, beautiful painting. It's enormous. It's huge. It's as big as the side of the building, right? And it's got vibrant blues, incredible characters. I don't know how many different uh, people and angels are pictured within that painting, but it, it's a lot. And some of them are celebrating, and some of them are lamenting and are in despair. And they're at the center it's the Lord Jesus, wrapped in these vibrant blues that will take your breath away. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. The last judgment is beautiful. And not just the painting, but the whole idea and I know that here in 2024, that's a really weird thing for a preacher to say. But I want to tell you that I find the last judgment, not just the painting, but the day of Jesus, I find it to be beautiful. I don't know that I always felt that way. But part of what helped me come to that place was the Psalms. Because in the Psalms, and I, I, I want to say what we're doing when we read the Psalms. When, in the Psalms, what we're really doing is we're, we as Christian people are connecting. The Psalms help us connect with the roots of Christian spirituality. The early days of the church, the, the, the Psalms infuse all of the hearts of the, those early disciples, those early Jewish disciples that had grown up not just learning and reciting these Psalms, but singing them. They were their worship hymns. Now, I know that some of you could have closed your eyes tonight and as, as the songs were led, you could have, how many of you could have sung all those verses of to God be the glory without even looking up? Well, imagine if the Psalms were your hymn book and you knew Psalm, not just Psalm 23, but you knew Psalm 54 and you knew Psalm 45. That's a weird one. If you knew Psalm, uh, you know, 62 or 69 or 17, and they were as deeply wrapped in your heart as were the lines of the song, to God be the glory, great things he has done. For the early church, so it was. And so it is that they can't help. When the New Testament is written, it erupts with the language of the Psalms at every turn. The Psalms show up all through the Gospels. They show up in all of the books, okay? Over two-thirds of the Psalms a hundred different psalms make either a direct quotation or, or are either directly quoted or alluded to in the New Testament. It's an outrageous number. The psalms are all through the New Testament, and they're the people that gave us the New Testament, it's clear that the spirituality that they are writing from, that the Spirit is using the psalms that were sung to them 
to help teach what it means to be part of the way of Jesus and to recognize what Jesus is doing in the world. The Psalms help us connect with those deep roots of Christian spirituality, the praises and the laments, the expectations of the Messiah, the hopes and the dreams, and sometimes the despair. And so when I th- would read the Psalms, and the Psalms are part of my regular prayer practice, when I re- re- read the Psalms, I would hear all those familiar notes. But among all those other tones and harmonies and melodies that I was used to in the Psalms, their theological melodies and harmonies, I mean, I kept hearing this other tone. And judgment is like a forgotten note that you hear often played in the Psalms. It shows up in the first Psalm when we hear them say that sinners will not stand in the assembly of the righteous, right? Or in the wicked, wicked in the day of judgment. Or it'll show up in Psalm 2 where Jesus the, or the Messiah that's pictured in Psalm 2 and the, the early New Testament writers loved Psalm 2, but he has a, a sep, an iron scepter and people have to come and kiss his feet, kiss the Messiah's feet with fear and trembling, it says, right? Or Psalm 7 or Psalm 9. Or if we fast forward a way through, we won't go through all of them. I can't do them by the numbers. But Psalm 96. Psalm 96, that is our text today, will carry us with a rich, some rich language that is very common. And it's going to say something that's going to be so striking, so strikingly different from the way that we think about the judgment. And here's what I want you to listen for as we read this, okay? The strange thing that struck me as I read about the judgment in the Psalms is that the ancient poets want God to come as judge. They want God to come and judge. And the fact that God will come and judge the the world is not just something that they're afraid of. It's something that they desire. And that seems so counterintuitive to me that I think it's worth dwelling in and and asking why that is. If you would turn to Psalm 96, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Tell his, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works from among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the earth. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts and worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth and say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity or justice. And so let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. And then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
Psalm 96 is not alone. We've already read some of the other or referenced some of the others. But if you flip, maybe, maybe you don't even have to flip your page to see Psalm 98 just after this, right? And you'll hear some of it. You'll hear some familiar lines in Psalm 98. Nobody's doing Psalm 98 next week, are they? Okay, great. That was a funny joke, right? <laughs> oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre and with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the, the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the world and all who live in it, let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord. For He is coming to judge the earth. And He will judge the world with righteousness. And his peoples with equity. Do you hear that strange, old, forgotten note? And how weirdly played it is in these psalms. This incredible uh, road to praise, this doxology that sings about the praise of God. And then it comes to a place and it says, give, give thanks to all the world. Let the seas clap their hands. Let the mountains rejoice. Why is it? Why is it that the seas should be clapping? Why is it that the forest should be shouting praise? No other reason than this. That God is coming to judge the world. What a strange cause for praise, right? What a strange reason to burst out in such exuberant praise in all the world. What a strange reason for creation to cry out. Not necessarily because God will come to save or God will come and have victory or whatever, but because God will come and bring judgment. So counterintuitive, at least to my intuition, and so strange, I think, in the world in which we live, to expect the occasion of the judgment to be a cause of joy and celebration. Does that sound as strange to you as it does to me? Not rhetorical. Does that seem as strange to you as it does to me? And yet, we who have been come from the way of Jesus in the body of the church, who have been fed, hopefully in the same spiritual stream as our forebears who, who drank deeply of these psalms. We don't find it that way. And so the judgment of God and is either ignored or it's distorted in the modern church. We just find it to be maybe something of an embarrassment that God will do some separating of good and evil, naming and calling out what is. Or... Maybe it's not ignored. In lots of places, the judgment is distorted and it's used solely as a, a tool for fear and for manipulation. It's what the old fire and brimstone preaching used to do and trying to force people to do something in the way of Jesus and in ways that I think are very different than the ways that the, the early church maybe used this judgment theme. In other words, let me put it this way, and this may be a strange way of thinking about judgment, but I think that the distortion that also causes us to ignore judgment in our conversations today is because we perceive judgment primarily as a bad thing. We primarily think of judgment as bad news, not good news. Not as something that we would think about as a category of the gospel. And I want to go a little bit further and hopefully claw at a little bit of nuance to get our head around something uh, that I think can help us move from that, that 
caricature of judgment as just bad news. And I want to play with a couple of words, a couple of phrases for us. Judgment and condemnation, and also think about the grace of God in it. Because a lot of times, our way of thinking about the gospel and the way that it mean, what it means on the last day is something like this. I don't even know if I can say this out loud without it sounding like a straw man, but I, I honestly believe this is a deal. We sort of think of being a Christian is a way of protecting you from the last judgment. It's a way of dealing with God's judgment, and it being baptized is kind of a way, and, and taking on the identity of a Christian sort of protects you from that moment. And the impression that a lot of people get, okay, and by the way, there's probably some truth to that, okay? But when we distill the gospel into only that, then we begin to have the impression, and I think this is what a lot of our people are walking around carrying, maybe some of you intuit the gospel in this way, that what it effectively does is it kind of gives you like, I don't know, what's a, like a backstage pass to heaven. And so you show up at the last day, and God is judging all the people, and you walk up and you say, I, I'm, I'm a Jesus person. Or Jesus will say, hey, that's one of mine. I mean, you hear that language, right? Oh, that's one of mine. Let him in, you know. And then you just kind of like skip the line. You know what I'm saying? I have a friend who would tell me he, has, he had like some kind of membership at Panera. And he said that he would go in and if the line was really busy, that they knew him well enough that like the lady would just be like, you know, here's your coffee. And like would just like put it on the counter and tell him to go past all the line. And I think that's the way that Christians sometimes think about the judgment. That the gospel is a way of eluding the judgment. Does that sound right? And perhaps we've picked it up from places like where Paul says in Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in our minds, what we hear when he says there's no condemnation is we hear there is no judgment. And those words are related, right? Those, are, those words are related. They're just as related in Greek as they are in English. And sometimes I have this sense that what we think about our faith in our relationship to Jesus is that it is a way of avoiding the last judgment. And yet, in the way that the New Testament thinks about judgment, and judgment is all over the New Testament. It's in all four of the Gospels. It's in almost all of Paul's letters. It's in Peter's letters. It's in John's letters. Even the book of Hebrews, whoever wrote that, finds a way to talk about the judgment. Even the tiny little book of Jude finds a way of talking importantly and significantly about the last day of judgment. Judgment with its vivid portrayals in Revelation and its mentions almost all the way through the rest of the New Testament, is at the core of what they were thinking about. And Paul can say very clearly, right, that all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's not just talking to outsiders when he says that. Paul says to Christians, to believers that all of us must stand before God and at, the last, at, the, at the day of judgment for an accounting for the deeds done in the body, he says. And he's saying that to Christians. Christians will be judged. So here's, here's the dilemma, right? Like this is the knot. Because all I, I hope that we believe in the grace of Jesus that saves us from condemnation. But how do we hold together? Or can we have enough of a nuanced understanding to say that we believe that in Jesus there is no condemnation. But we also believe that everyone will be judged in Christ Jesus. Can you hold those two things together? I don't know. I think part of the way that I think about that, and I'm just offering this to you, I think it's worth all of us doing some mind work and reflecting on this a little bit, is I would just 
separate out this story, instead of it being about like you kind of skip the line and you have a, a pass to kind of avoid the judgment altogether, I think really the statement is that God is going to judge the entirety of the earth. And all of us will have to be able to see what it is that we've done and what it meant and whether it was good or it was bad, right? And I think the judgment is about a moment of truth in all that. It's about a moment of truth of being able to have to give an account of your life. Now, I want to talk a little bit about why I think that's so important to take, reclaim that perspective. Being compelled to give an account of your life does not necessarily mean, though, that you are then under the wrath of God. Because in Jesus, even as we give an account of our lives, God is giving us grace and forgiveness. And he's taking care of us even in that moment. But there will be no mistaking the account that we have to give of our lives. You understand what I'm saying? How those two things have to be held together? These words... These, these concepts of judgment and condemnation and the grace of God, they have to be held in balance and relationship in, in a nuanced way with each other. I believe that the grace of God, and the love that is God has for us in Christ Jesus is the most powerful force in the universe. I also believe that I'll give an accounting of my life to God. Now, my sins, they're no match for the love of God. They're no match for the grace of Jesus. But I still will speak them before God, or I'll have him speak them to me. I'll still give an account of my life. And I think it's important and sobering for us to hold that. But that's not quite enough yet, is it? At least that's not quite enough for us to identify with what the psalmist is saying. Because that's still a sobering moment of like, uh, all right, I can have some kind of theology that holds that there's going to be a judgment, but it still doesn't quite look like something I'm looking forward to. Right? So what would it mean for us to take a little step further and to see the gospel as, uh, or as something that includes judgment? For... What does it mean? How can judgment be good news? Do you know that Paul in Romans 2, he's talking about how the, the Gentiles, when they obey the law, sometimes the, by the, just their actions, they obey the law of God without really knowing what they're doing. Okay? And in that conversation, Paul says that these Gentiles, I mean, they're, they're in, in that way, they're going to have to give an account of God too, and that'll be, everything will be found out. And he says, on the day when according to my gospel, Jesus, Jesus judges everyone on the last day. He says that the judgment is part of his gospel. Isn't that strange? Because it doesn't sound like good news. It sounds like bad news. But for Paul, his good news of Jesus included the idea, the idea of judgment. Or in, in Acts chapter 10, when Paul, or when Peter rather, is speaking to Cornelius and has this moment where God has basically ushered in a time where he can speak the gospel to these new, uh, these people that are coming to believe. And in, Roman, and in, in Acts, Acts chapter 10, when, when Peter is speaking before Cornelius, hear how he describes the good news. First he says in verse 34, 
I truly understand God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses that to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not only to all the people, not to all the people, but to us who ate and drank with, or who were chosen with, by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And so far, so good, right? And then it says this. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge for the living and the dead. Or as the old creeds or Westerns say, the quick and the dead, right? When Peter has just, a, a, when he comes to this moment, in just a few verses, what he has to say about Jesus, some of it's the familiar stuff. It's about the forgiveness that Jesus offers and the acceptance that God is bringing the nations to him. And it's about the story of his death and then his, the testimony of his resurrection. But then Paul, Peter includes, I keep calling him Paul, the, things that, the thing that Peter includes there at the end is that Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the one that will judge the living and the dead. This is not unusual in the book of Acts. Paul, really Paul this time, will say something similar in Acts chapter 17 when he's preaching in Athens. Later on when he's speaking before Felix, he'll say something similar as well. It's surprising how many times the judgment comes up in the apostles' proclamation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And in there with it, embedded, is the idea that the judgment is part of the good news. It's part of the good news. How can that be? How can it be that what... Jesus is going to do on that last day will be good news. Or maybe another way of asking that is to say, for whom is the judgment of God good news? Most often in the Psalms and in Psalm 96, when the psalmist cries out their desire for God to come and to judge the earth, they are talking about the violence and injustice that people experience in the world. And so the cry goes out like it did from old Egypt when the enslaved Israelites cried out to God for deliverance, and what they're really crying out for is that Pharaoh would experience the judgment of God, and they would experience release. And through their history and the ups and downs of what happened with Israel in the, in the time that they often found themselves oppressed as a people, they found themselves crying out again for God to come and give them deliverance. And not just that they would be delivered, but that God would be the judge. And that God would rectify the great injustices that they experience. If the question is not just how can judgment be good news, but for whom is God's judgment good, good news, the answer is for all those who suffer, in long, uh, suffer injustice and long for justice. Maybe the reason that I don't long for God's judgment is quite simply because I've got it too easy. You know who doesn't have a problem believing in God's justice and judgment? Who doesn't have a problem longing for it? Someone who has been greatly victimized by somebody that's more powerful than themselves. It is good news 
that there will be a reckoning for the injustice of our world. For the great violence and harm that people do to each other based on all kinds of foolishness, nationality, race, economics, priority and privilege, all the injustice that's rampant in our world, and God sees it all and there will be a reckoning for it. There will be a reckoning for it. And maybe if that's not good news to me, oh God, have mercy on me. Because maybe I'm not quite ready for the great reversal of God. God's judgment was a good thing for Lazarus. But for the rich man. But which side of that story or all the other stories of God's judgment, which side do I see myself on? There will be reckoning for the injustice of our world. And the psalmist writes, often from the perspective of those who are suffering great injustice. And so they cry out from their heart, Oh God, would you come and judge the earth? Would you bring righteousness and equity or justice? Would you bring those things to the earth at last? And when it sees the hope that in the Messiah, Jesus, that those things will finally come and that God will be, will be at work bringing justice and righteousness to the world again, the psalmist can't help but cry out and say, let the hills, let the hills cry out. Let the forest sing for joy. Let the, the oceans clap its hands. For God is going to come. God is going to come. And there will be a reckoning. There will be a reckoning. I think the way that this bit of gospel, and I do think it's gospel, is coming to me, is that that I'm starting to understand more and more what it is that God cares about. And to say that God does see the violence And God does see the harms and the way that people abuse their power. God does see all that. He's not blind to it. It's good news. It's a challenging bit of good news that challenges the way that I live and challenges the the way that I want to live in in my world. I want to be about the, the things that God is about right now. And when I think about what it will mean someday to give an account of my life before God, I want to make sure that I'm aligning myself with the things that God cares about. So on the day of the reckoning, on the day of the reckoning, I can acknowledge my faults and my failings and my sins. But because of the work of Jesus and his spirit in my life, I'll have been drawn towards the way of righteousness and the way of justice. And that still won't be enough. And I'll throw myself on the grace of Lord Jesus. And I'll say whatever was short in me, oh God, it is to you. Reclaiming this thread It challenges the way I live as a disciple of Jesus. And it also also has other effects on the way that I live in my life. I think one of the, the sad side effects of abandoning any idea of the judgment or just acting as though we're going to skip that whole phase on the last day, one of the side effects of that is that it minimizes the living of our lives. So that we come to believe that the whole point of this thing is that at some point you get in the water. And as long as you've done that, well, you can kind of go, go about living your life as you want. Or at least don't do rude sins. Reclaiming an idea of the reckoning of God, I think, compels us to take whatever space it is after we become a disciple of Jesus and lean more into God's way. 
It's a redemptive thing that says what happens in the world, what happens in our lives, actually matters. And when we act as though that the, the point of the Christian way is just to skip, skip ahead in the line at the judgment, what we end up doing is we invalidate all the rest of our experience of life, which wasn't baptism. We kind of abandon the spiritual meaning of all the other stuff. But reclaiming the idea of the reckoning helps us be more poised to live our lives with meaning, to align our lives with God. Well, I think part of our struggles with discipleship stem from our subtle abandoning of the judgment of God. And I think people who claim this and begin to have an understanding of what it is that the, the gods at work doing what God will do on the last day. I think they become more compelled to seek the way of Jesus and to follow more closely to the Lord. I think that's all part of what happens in this reclamation of good news. I think if I was going to say it in the most blunt way that I can, Jesus will set things right. And our gospel, which is way too personalized and way too individualized, is not wrong when it's saying that God will, in Jesus, He will set me right and He will set my soul right and He'll claim me into His presence in the last day. I, 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 believe, all, I believe all of that. That's, that's fine. But it sort of centers God's work just in me as an individual. And that seems to sell things a little short. Ultimately, the good news that is the best news is not just that Jesus will set me right. It's that Jesus will set all things right. And that's the gospel of the judgment, that God sees and he cares and he holds the world. And the one who created the cosmos is its king to this day. And on the last day, he will reclaim it for himself. And all that is broken will be made right. Jesus is coming. And the world groans and waits for that. And we groan and wait for that. And the psalmist was groaning and waiting for that, longing for the day. Longing for the day when Jesus will set things right. I need to drink from that stream more often. I need to be nurtured by that piece of bread. I need to have my soul fed by the deep roots that are the Psalms that over and over and over remind me that God sees and that God knows and that God will come. He will come to set things right. Amen. Lord, come quickly. Let us pray together. Oh God, we pray before you in solidarity with every suffering soul on this planet. For those who have been harmed by our hands, we beg your forgiveness. And God, for those who suffer under deep oppression in our world, we cry out along with them. We say, how long, O Lord, and we ask for their deliverance. And O God, we pray that you will indeed come 
that you will indeed come and judge the world with justice and equity and righteousness. And Father, that you will come and set things right. For we are too broken to mend it by ourselves. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Worship you.